Good morning. Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. And this morning we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 17. You can find that on page 1039 in your Bibles there in front of you. We uh, press on in our series with the preaching class on uh, New Testament quotations of the Old Testament. And this text before us <clears throat> this morning is, um, Matthew records the dialogue between Jesus and his disciples. The, G, uh, the disciples come and ask Jesus why he's been teaching in parables, and uh, we see his answer here in these verses. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 10, and I'll read down to verse 17. Please give your attention to the word of God. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a privilege it is to gather at the feet of Jesus, as it were, this cold morning, and to hear these words from his lips. And Lord, I would ask that this morning you would open our eyes and open our ears and soften our hearts so this word would fall on good soil, that we would truly hear and truly perceive that we would see the glories and the, the mysteries of the kingdom and of the king. For we ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see God the kingdom of God. He who has ears, let him hear. Brothers and sisters, this morning, how is your spiritual sense perception? Are you truly seeing? Are you truly hearing? Have you seen and have you heard the truths, the secrets of Christ's kingdom? and of the King. This passage before us this morning is a very sobering one because it draws a very stark line between those who truly see and hear the teachings of the King about His kingdom and those who cannot and will not hear Him and see Him and reject the kingdom and reject Him as the King that He is and are condemned and judged for it. This passage is also a unique opportunity because it gives us the chance to uh, pull aside with the disciples and huddle around Jesus and listen in as we hear directly from the mind of Christ about why he is doing what he is doing, as he explains his ministry, as he explains that he is in fact a conquering king. C.S. Lewis said of Aslan, he is not a tame lion. 
And brothers and sisters, the same is true of Christ. He came preaching and teaching a message that divided his hearers. And to some, his words were the words of life, but to others, they were the words of death. He came as a king to build a heavenly kingdom, subduing enemies in judgment, as well as subduing disciples in grace, revealing himself to them. Well, this morning, those of you here who have seen this king, who have truly heard of this kingdom and belong to it by grace through faith, this passage calls you to rejoice that Christ's kingdom has been revealed to you. Rejoice that his kingdom has been revealed to you and trust him to build it even in a world that rejects him. Trust this king to build his kingdom even in the midst of a world that is rejecting him. Well, in this text, the disciples come to Jesus because they want to understand why he's been speaking and teaching in parables. And Jesus really gives two answers to their question of why he speaks in parables. He tells them first it is to reveal his kingdom to those who would hear and, to li- and listen, to help them understand even more the nature of his kingdom. And this would be a tremendous blessing for those who could hear and could see. But he also explained that he was speaking in parables in order to conceal these blessings, these truths and the secrets of the kingdom from those who had been rejecting him, who had been rejecting their God, who would not listen and would not see. Well, I want to actually begin first by considering the latter purpose of the parables first. The purpose of concealing the kingdom, exposing the blindness and rejection of the Jews. This is often, uh, this is actually the aspect of this uh, passage that can be very difficult to grasp, difficult to understand. At first reading, it can really sound like Jesus is perhaps being unfair. You might think to yourself, I thought Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Didn't he come to be a light to the blind? Wasn't he sent to reveal the Father? Why would he want to conceal his message? Why would he want some not to be able to hear, not to be able to see? Another question you might have is, if they are in fact blind and cannot hear this word, why does he hold them responsible for not uh, turning and repenting? It might not seem right to us as we just glance at this passage. And these are, in fact, tough questions, and this is no easy uh, passage to understand. But I want us to remember uh, first, really before we dig in here, that the Scripture affirms both the justice and goodness of God over and over again. And it also teaches both the absolute sovereignty of God in salvation and election but also the responsibility and culpability of, uh, culpability of man, sinners. It's also very important to take note of the fact that uh, to, to not read this text out of context. We can't just read it in isolation. We need to understand Matthew 13, 10 to 17 in light of the whole of Old Testament history re- leading up to this. We need to understand the rebellion and hard-heartedness of God's people, of Israel. We also need to see this text in light of the ministry of Jesus leading up to this point. Well, with those things in mind, let us consider then Jesus' reply to his disciples. Look again at verse 11. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. Jesus says that the natural man, the common Israelite in the crowd, cannot understand the secrets of the kingdom. These things must be given, must be revealed. And then he says in verse 12, For to the one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. You see, the Jews, the people of God, had so much as the covenant people of God. 
They had the full testimony of the law and the prophets. They had all of the covenant promises and prophecies. They had all the types and shadows, the sacrificial system, all pointing them ahead to that coming Messiah. But sadly, tragically, they couldn't see the secrets of the kingdom. When the king finally came in the fullness of time, they didn't even recognize him. They had seen his miracles. They heard him speak and teach with authority. They had the testimony of John the Baptist before him, and still their ears were closed, and their eyes were shut. And so all this that they had, even what they had, would be taken from them. John said in his gospel that Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. They could not see the king or his kingdom. They were rejecting him. And so Jesus says in verse 13, This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. You see, there is a a great difference between hearing and hearing. Hearing and actually listening. They had been hearing him, But in reality, they were not hearing him. And my wife and I recently had this illustrated for us with our son. We were a little bit concerned about his hearing. But our doctor assured us that he had fine hearing. And he reminded us that there is a significant difference, especially at his age, between hearing and listening. (laughs) You see, the sound waves can be coming in and, and can be registering. But if the mind is not engaged, there's no true listening. There's no true hearing. There's no true understanding. And the result is that there's no response, no obedience. And so sadly, this is what was going on with Israel. And so many of the Israelites had for centuries been seeing but not seeing, hearing but not hearing, rejecting God's prophets rejecting his teaching, rejecting his law, forsaking him, going to false gods. And this was the situation in Isaiah's day. And that's exactly where Jesus took his disciples. He's saying, what happened in Isaiah's day, what Isaiah spoke and the rejection that he faced is being fulfilled now, is being carried out right now. And so Jesus quotes from Isaiah. Look at verse 14 and 15. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. This was the message given by God to Isaiah as God commissioned Isaiah, called him to go speak for him in chapter 6 of Isaiah. God commissioned him, said, Go and say to these people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. What a commission, what a message to be given. How would you like to begin in your first church and hear from the presbytery? You know, you're going to preach, but they're not going to hear. And you're going to preach, but they're going to be asleep. Their their eyes will be closed. And in fact, your very preaching will harden them, will be judgment against them. What a commission, what a message. And Isaiah responds to the Lord, Lord, how long? How long do I have to preach this? The Lord responds to him, until cities lie waste, until the Lord removes his people far away. Until the judgment, the exile. Well, why? Why was Isaiah called to preach this message? It's because Judah had forsaken their God. They had despised and rejected their God. They had forgotten him. They had forgotten his laws. They had turned to false gods. And so they became deaf and blind. We sang about it in in Psalm 115. Those who make these gods will become like them. So they couldn't hear 
the word of Isaiah, the, the judgment, the, the promises. That was Isaiah's world. Blindness, rejection, idolatry, unbelief, unrepentance. And this was also Jesus' world. Just like Isaiah, Jesus was also speaking to God's covenant people. But they did not want to hear him. They didn't want to see him. Their hearts had grown dull. They were dead in their sins and in their unbelief, persisting in rebellion. And so Jesus is saying here essentially, okay, fine. If you want to persist in rejecting me, if you want to refuse not to see and not to hear, then at this point I'm going to make sure that you don't, that you don't hear, that you don't see. I'm going to teach in such a way as to conceal the truth from your hard hearts. You and your fathers have been rejecting my father for years. And so the parables were in part judgment on God's rebellious people. It's almost as though Jesus at this point in his ministry is shaking the dust from his sandals. I'm not going to open your eyes. In fact, these things will remain a mystery to you. And they will be an instrument of judgment. They will further harden your hard hearts. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's saying, you've been given the chance, but you are not willing to turn and be healed. And so I'm moving on. I'm going to continue teaching and preaching, but I'm going to do so in a way that those who have ears will hear and be blessed and be enlightened and be given the kingdom. But those of you responding in unbelief will be condemned further hardened, rejected, exposed for who you are. Well, this is a very sobering reply from Jesus, is it not? What a condemnation. And what a warning for those of us here today. May there be no one here that is blind and that does not truly hear the word. Friends, don't be those who hear and yet do not hear. And don't assume that just because you are part of the covenant people of God or just because you're a seminary student that you don't have to hear these things, that you don't have to be careful to make sure that you are truly seeing, that you are repenting and believing. We need to hear these warnings, especially us as we so regularly get to sit under the teaching and preaching of God's word. We need to ask ourselves and be very honest with ourselves. Are we truly hearing? Are we truly seeing? Am I here for God's glory or am I faking it? Well, this reply from Jesus can sound severe. It can sound unfair and rather unreasonable. But remember that these same people who were rejecting him would continue to grow so hardened that they would soon put him to death. We also need to remember that the very message of the kingdom in and of itself, as well as the gift and the ability to hear and to truly see, is a very gracious gift. It's not something that deserves, nobody, nobody deserves the free grace of God offered and revealed in the gospel of the kingdom. It's only the mercy and grace of God that lets anyone see, that lets anyone hear and be saved. And we can recoil at God's justice in rejecting those who reject Him, and sovereignly passing over them. But friends, that is justice. That is what every sinner deserves. That is what you and I deserve. What's far more perplexing and mind-boggling is the fact that God would reveal himself, would reveal the secrets of his kingdom to anyone, to any sinners. That's a far greater, a far awesome and sobering reality. Why would God reveal himself to any? And so Jesus explained the second reason why he spoke in parables. It was to reveal the truths of his kingdom to those who would truly hear, who would truly see. 
Look again at verse 11. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given. To you it has been given. To the one who has, more will be given. You see, the disciples, those who were truly seeing and hearing, could only do so because these things had been given to them. Graciously given. Not because of anything they possessed in and of themselves. These parables, these teachings of Jesus were gracious gifts of divine revelation given to further open up the secrets of the kingdom, those things that had previously been unknown, now revealed. They are given. They are revealed. You see, they're given because by nature the disciples were no different from the fellow Israelites. By nature, they too were unbelieving, deaf, blind, sinners, just like you and I. By their nature, in their sin, they would have rejected Christ and His kingdom as well. But by God's power and grace, He effectually called them. He opened their eyes and their ears. Their dull hearts of stone had been replaced with a heart of flesh. He wanted to equip these disciples to go out and preach His kingdom and preach the crucified and risen King and to see it grow and to be built. Jesus also wanted them to be in awe of the fact that he would reveal himself to any, and especially that he would reveal himself to them. And so he concluded, But blessed are your eyes, verse 16, for they see, and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. He's telling his disciples, you are seeing what the prophets and righteous people only look forward to. And Jesus is saying, yes, it is tragic that so many do not and will not see. Of course, that's by the sovereign will of my Father. But do you realize how blessed, how privileged you are to have been brought out of that camp, out of sinful, unbelieving Israel, that world of rejection, blindness, Are you so amazed that your eyes have been opened at all? And brothers and sisters, from where you stand this morning, today, you have an even greater blessing than these disciples. You have a more full picture of the kingdom as you look back on the work of Christ. And I want you to hear these words of Christ as if he was speaking them directly to you, as if you were in that huddle of disciples. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Just like Isaiah, just like the disciples, friends, you are living in a world that cannot see, that cannot hear. By the amazing grace and the powerful work of God in your life, your ears and your eyes have been opened And you and you alone can see the realities of Christ and His kingdom. And friends, this ought to cause you to rejoice. To fall down in awe. To praise God. To marvel at His grace to you. Why would He save such a sinner? Why would He desire that you be His own treasured possession? Part of His kingdom. We need to hurry up and finish here. But I want you to remember that this dialogue between Jesus and his disciples comes right in between the parable of the sower and where Jesus explains that parable. And that's that's significant how Matthew arranges his account. You see, Matthew wants to show us what Jesus is saying here by his response to the disciples is that my preaching, my teaching, my word of the kingdom will fall on poor soil. It will fall along the path. It will fall among the thorns. It will be rejected. There will be those who hear and yet do not hear, do not turn. But yet, there will be seed 
that falls on good soil. There will be more like you, my disciples. My kingdom will be built, both in judgment and rejection, but also grace and revelation. And we need to see this morning that Christ will build his kingdom, even in a world that is rejecting him. And that is precisely the message of the rest of the parables in this chapter, the parables of the kingdom, that Christ is going to build his kingdom even in a world that rejects him. Brothers, do you believe that Christ is building, has been building, and will continue to build his kingdom in this fallen world, calling the deaf and the blind to himself? He says a couple chapters later in Matthew, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then after he had died and risen again, before he ascended, he said to his disciples, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. I will be with you always. Now I want you to go and teach and preach this message of the kingdom. Make disciples of all the nations. And as many of you take up that great task, you need to do so knowing that the word of God, if it's preached faithfully, will be effectual. That it will be a double-edged sword. It will divide. The word of the kingdom will accomplish that purpose for which God sends it. Whether that is to conceal and judge or to reveal and give life. So brothers, preach with boldness. Preach with confidence as you proclaim the king and his kingdom. And yes, there will be bad soil. There will be those that persist in rejection, blind and deaf, and your word will harden them and will in fact add to their condemnation. But don't be surprised by that. Even Jesus, that was even the case with Jesus' own teaching and preaching. But men, go forth believing that God will also be pleased to reveal himself through you. Eyes will be opened. Closed ears will be opened. Secrets of the kingdom will be given. Seeds will fall on good soil. Will produce fruit. Friends, do you believe that Christ will do this? Do you truly believe that he is building his kingdom? Do you believe that to some you will be the aroma of death? You will preach a message of foolishness. But that to many you will be the aroma of Christ. The aroma of life to those perishing. The power of God unto salvation. Do you realize that men and and women? So be encouraged, be bold, be excited about this. Trust in your king. Brothers and sisters, rejoice that Christ's kingdom has been revealed to you and trust him to continue to build it even in a world that rejects him. Let's pray.